Remember to turn on all notifications so you don't miss a video. Now, we've reached the final season of Teen Titans. This season has Beast Boy as the protagonist of the overarching story. Will this season keep up the consistency, or will he drop the ball and fall off? Let's find out. This episode starts off great, as usual, straight into the action. A superhero group named the Doom Patrol are attacking the base of the Brotherhood of Evil. Beast Boy is one of the five members of Doom Patrol, meaning this takes place in the past. The BOE has a quantum generator, which has the ability to generate black holes. Their leader is Brain. When BB gets captured, the DP leader says that he'll have to fend for himself and plans to focus on the mission. This decision and trait are important. When the heroes all get captured, the leader tells BB to destroy the generator, but he frees his allies instead, using a T-Rex, which is now his signature, for the first time. It's cool how he unlocked this power under great stress. Negative Man is able to destroy the generator, but the leader, Mento, snaps at Beast Boy for disobeying orders. Mento prioritizes the mission over the safety of his teammates, while Beast Boy is the opposite. The others try to get Mento to chill out, but he stays acting OC. This is the first flashback in the cartoon, and I love it. It's so concise. It introduces a philosophical conflict, the main antagonist of the season, some new characters, and shows what BB was like before. His outfit is the same, except he has a mask. His squeaky voice and amateur shapeshifting show how far he's come in the present. He also lacks any comedy, which is now a major part of his character. Speaking of comedy, after the intro, he's doing prop stand-up in the present and plays a part of the intro. That's the second time the intro has been referenced in the show. The first was with Cyborg in Season 3. Then the plot kicks in. The Doom Patrol is in trouble and BB is called to help. The Titans go to a jungle and Beast Boy takes charge after they find DP's crashed ship. He even has a little bit of an attitude, which is rare. The first one they find and save is Robot Man. I like how the team occasionally uses real names. Mento is called Steve in the cold open, and BB calls Robot Man Cliff. It shows a higher level of camaraderie. Mento's mentality is subtly referenced again when BB says, we're gonna find them, and Robot Man thinks, them, is the Brotherhood when he actually met the patrol. BB says Titans go in this episode. Maybe he needs a team of his own. The action scene has good music, so motion blur, and JT cam. I like the cut where Cyborg fires his laser and the camera zooms out to follow the shot. The background is animated here. Robot Man solos the tank, but Robin and BB tell him that he needs to work as a team with them. This ain't the Doom Patrol. The Titans and Robot Man save the remaining members of TP before Brain can kill them. Robin has Goku's power pole again. The Titans save the patrol members one by one. This action scene is also great and has the same traits as the other one, with the addition of better choreography. It really feels like this season is going to consistently use these tricks. It's an all-out brawl with several combatants and even some teamwork. BP got knocked out earlier, so when Brain traps the heroes, he's the only one who's free. The villains are escaping, and the story comes full circle. Mento tells BB to stop the villains from escaping, but the Titans tell him to save them because the building is collapsing. Once again, BB chooses to save his friends rather than stop the enemy, but this time, the villains actually succeed due to his choice. BB and the Titans respect this choice while Mento doesn't. It ends with Mento saying the brain has a working quantum generator thanks to BB's choice. The Doom Patrol leaves. The theme of this episode is Family Comes First. This was conveyed perfectly. Rob Hoagie wrote this. This is easily the best opening episode of any Teen Titans season. There is a philosophical argument. Do you prioritize the mission or the safety of your allies? This argument is set up in the cold open. Mento is on the side of the mission while Beast Boy is on the side of allies. In the climax, BP has Mento as the devil on his shoulder and the Titans as the angel on his shoulder. He makes the right decision, the same decision as in the past. And this decision comes with a sacrifice, increasing his weight. This provides BB with a flat character arc, which is where a character starts with character trait or belief A, has that trait challenged, and sticks with the trait through adversity. This character arc also reveals what BB values at his core. He values his friends more than the mission. We also get to see Beast Boy's past, and there's a beautiful full circle moment when the present reflects the past. This is already one of the best episodes, and it's only half of the two-parter. The episode starts with Mento explaining the members of the Brotherhood of Evil. I will be calling Monsieur Mala Gorilla Grodd because I'm more used to that name. Maybe they call him Monsieur to match with Madame. The BOE establishes high stakes with their world ending generator. Mento wants BB back in the patrol, but when the Titans say they're coming too, the DP starts disrespecting them and an argument ensues. I like how each character argues with their counterpart. Robin and Mento are the leaders, Cyborg and Robot Man are the robots, Starfire and Elastigirl are the nice ones, Raven and Negative Man are the laid back sarcastic ones. They actually don't argue. The Incredibles really stole the name Elastigirl. Technically this one has a hyphen, but it's the same thing. BP joins DP and they go their separate ways. The flaws of the DP show once again. When Robot Man falls into quicksand, 
The others quickly save him and say nothing is wrong. When BB suggests calling the Titans, Mantle refuses. The Doom Patrol is the second time adult heroes have appeared, and once again, they're a bad influence. The first was Valior. This cartoon gives the Titans their respect by never allowing adult heroes to outclass them. While they may have more experience, they always have character flaws that hold them down. During the fight against the machine, the DP leaves Robot Man behind. BB questions this decision, but Mento says Robot Man did his part. The others enable him. Mento calls Negative Man Larry. In the desert, they leave Negative Man and Elastigirl behind. Beast Boy calls her Rita. Mento prevents BB from going back for her and even destroys his communicator when he tries to call the Titans. This is the last straw. BB takes off his mask and refuses to follow Mento's orders. He says, I'm not a kid anymore. All the DP members treated the Titans like incompetent kids so far, but just because they are teens doesn't mean they're mentally immature. This was shown in episode 1 and will be shown here too. Mento sees the DP as his family, but he's stubborn when it comes to the mission. BB tells Mento a lesson about working smarter that he got from Robin and Mento respects it. Beast Boy ascends to leader status. He comes up with a plan and the two crash the base. BB's leadership allows him to avoid Madame Rouge, one of the most dangerous Brotherhood members. Beast Boy and Mento take down Grodd and Rouge. When General Amortis corners them, Mento compliments BB before they come up with a counterattack. The Teen Titans show up at the last minute with the remainder of the Doom Patrol. They did BB dirty again by having him get knocked out in his own episode. When Brain plans to use the black hole on Jump City, the two leaders shout out their catchphrases, which was hype. BB gets reparations when he relocates the target to their current location, the base. The base is destroyed and everyone makes it out in time. In the conclusion, Mento calls them kids but switches to Titans, showing that he respects them. Before leaving, Elastigirl calls BB Garfield. I swear the authors slowly revealed the characters' names to poetically signify how much story was left to tell. That was artful. Cyborg and Raven make fun of his real name. The comedy trio returns at the end of the episode. This is the first time a Titan's real name is revealed. Robins and Cyborgs were hinted at, but never said. Raven doesn't have a code name, and neither does Starfire. The fact that they didn't know his real name shows that he was closer to the DP. The theme of the episode is either work smarter, not harder, or don't be too rigid. It also carries on the theme from episode 1. I love this episode too. The way the DP was being left behind one by one was a great way of showing how crazy Mento was and really solidifying his philosophy. The plot was great and always felt like it was moving forward thanks to the dropping off of teammates. It had great character development for BB and Mento. It made the former cool, like the beast within. Speaking of the devil, I think he should have used that form in this episode. This might be the best multi-part in the entire cartoon, even above Apprentice. This episode was written by Richard Elliott and Simon Rassiopa. The duo wrote Can I Keep Him and Cyborg the Barbarian. The former was bad, but the latter was good. I remember Trust vividly. The first time I watched it, I got chills. This season is starting off crazy. Three back-to-back -back bangers. The episode starts with Wildebeest running from Madame Rouge. He has a communicator, which he got from Winner Take All, and contacts Robin, but is interrupted by Rouge. She reaches for the fallen communicator, but it breaks. This is written by Queen Amy Wolfram. In the convo between Grodd and Brain, we learn that Wildebeest was captured, and Hotspot, who was also in Winner Take All, has been located. Rouge finds Hotspot in action and argues with Brain. She wants to go after the Titans, not honorary Titans, but Brain wants to gain as much info before striking. He even disrespects her and tells her to follow orders, to which Rouge obeys, for now. I like how the villains don't all get along. Hotspot and Rouge fight. Hotspot is forced to run because Rouge is just too dangerous. During the fight, Rouge learns that she can't touch Hotspot without being burned. Robin finds Hotspot and tells him to follow. When hiding out, Robin asks for the communicator back, but Hotspot refuses. Robin then tells Hotspot to power down to conserve energy. When this doesn't work, Robin hides and turns back into Rouge. This is amazing. She's after the communicator and wants Hotspot to depower so she can fight him. Turning into Robin to try and achieve these goals was genius, but it hasn't worked yet. It's so clever and makes the viewers feel paranoid. She wants to earn his trust, the title of the episode. The real Robin is searching for beasts with Starfire. He finds the broken communicator. Meanwhile, the fake Robin says that he's called the Titans and tries to bring Hotspot out of town, but Hotspot wants to wait for backup. He's a smart man. Rouge slips up when she showers herself in Hotspot's unstoppable compliment, showing her arrogance, but she quickly covers her tracks. His heat starts melting her disguise, causing her to get too bossy. Hotspot stands his ground. She manipulates him into leaving, but when they're walking, she says Firestar instead of Starfire, but once again, she covers her tracks. Hotspot should've figured it out right here. She brings him to an oil field to power down. Smart move. The two argue and Hotspot leaves. Luckily, he's too stubborn to take orders, or he knows that it's dangerous to drop his guard by powering down. Rouge fights Hotspot again, but she also uses Robin's voice when she's out of sight to manipulate him. 
She also turns into Robin to try and get his communicator, but he decides to call the others himself. Robin says she keeps finding them because of his flames, and Hotspot reveals that his refusal to power down is because of the danger it poses, not his stubbornness. When he powers down, Rouge takes him out and uses his communicator to learn in the real Robin. Hotspot plays dead and seals the communicator. He breaks it to save the Titans and powers up to continue fighting. The fight moves to the oil field. Robin sees the explosions and heads in. Hotspot finds two Robins and doesn't know who to trust. The two Robins duke it out. The first person cut when the real deflects attacks with motion blur and cheeky cam looks awesome. The choreography in this fight is amazing. Hotspot and Rouge start fighting and for some reason she can hold on to him now. The fight ends with Rouge grabbing Hotspot from the rubble. When Robin finds him, he's powered down and gives him the communicator. The end reveals that this is Madame Rouge. She powered down as him because she wouldn't be able to replicate his heat. Genius. While this key episode lacks a theme again, the writing is phenomenal. The plot is always moving and there are great plot twists. Rouge's strategy was very clever. She felt like a horror movie monster with how dangerous and deceptive she was. I was really scared for Hotspot and in the end, she won. This episode solidified Madame Rouge as a legend, but how was she able to touch Hotspot? Last episode had Hotspot as the lead, this one has the Titans East. I really like how this season is taking time to focus on outside characters. It's a great way of building up to the finale, which will have all existing characters fight in one large battle. In the cold open, Control Freak returns with a challenge for the Titans, but they aren't home. This intro is Japanese, but this episode really isn't goofy. The East Side has their own blue T-ship, and they take over the tower for now. I like how Cyborg, their former leader, is the one giving them instructions, along with a list of villains. Freak and East Side meet each other, and neither has heard of the other. Freak also lusts for Starfire, giving her one more sucker over Raven. I like how Freak mentions that the Puppet King was only fought once when he isn't on the list of villains to look out for. He fights them, but his tech was designed for West Side, not East Side, so he leaves. I like that Moss and Menos are allowed to speak English because they wouldn't be able to get good development as main characters otherwise. East Side wants to prove that they are true titans throughout the episode. They easily take down some French bomber, which reminds me of another Incredibles villain, but Control Freak is their main trophy. Control Freak has a chat room of Discord and Reddit users who don't approve of Eastside. A montage of Eastside saving people is shown. Aqualad racks up a third girl interested in him. He's doing cyborg numbers, except cyborgs are more serious. The music is good as the Titans save people, but Bumblebee and Speedy are called the wrong names, showing that they haven't quite earned their stripes in Jump City. The Reddit and Discord mods continue to hate on Eastside. Speedy and Aqualad are disappointed by the lack of recognition, but B says that's not what they're here for. Did she get mad at being misnamed? Control Freak returns with a challenge for Eastside. In the second act break, the Eastside are given specific challenges based on their powers. These challenges will be televised. If they win, they get their desired recognition and stop Control Freak. It's all coming together. Characters that were saved and villains are shown watching this. A villain from the last episode is shown in jail. His episode came out between seasons 3 and 4. I didn't cover it because it wasn't important, but I might at the end. But Whoopi has to stop a train with a bomb on it while shrunken. What's with heroes and trains anyway? Aqualad has to stop the city's water supply from being polluted while fighting a robot shark. Mossy Menos have to push two buttons located on opposite sides of the city in five minutes. Speedy has to stop missiles from hitting the Bay Bridge without arrows. I like how all of the challenges have an extra layer of difficulty. The animation is beautiful thanks to animated backgrounds. When the man Aqualad saved started rooting for him, I started getting hype. And then the kid who called Speedy Robin calls him by his correct name. Even the French bomber, LeBlanc, starts praising them. All the Titans use creativity to solve their problems. Even the internet dorks start praising them. In the end, the city's praising them, finally giving them the recognition they deserve, and it's emotional and epic. They also capture Control Freak, completing all their goals. While I can't say there's a clear theme here, it's a phenomenal episode. The east side fighting for recognition, and finally gaining it after saving the city was so cool. The smart strategies used to solve the challenges were brilliant. While the titans had no character arcs, they changed the city's perception of them, which is a type of flat character arc. That's four great episodes in a row. This is a Starfire episode. It starts with Red Star freeing a bear and then unleashing his powers on some thugs. The Titans arrive in Russia after a distress signal and are told of some abomination that wreaks havoc. Starfire doesn't need winter clothes and some little boy stares at her. He has good eyes. This reminds me of that scene in JLU where Wonder Woman says, what's wrong with the way I dress? Those writers came to work horny every day, but I ain't complaining. Some red guy shoots their ship down and they start scrapping. The lightning and visual effects when Starfire blocks the blast look cool. Starfire chases him down on her own because Red Man's radiation can't harm her. How is she getting blown over by wind? Then she starts getting cold. 
She didn't need a jacket before, so is it colder here? Robin wanted to go after her, and she says his name as she passes out. I still don't know why they didn't seal the deal. The coded man from the intro saves Star and gives her shelter. Red Star reveals that he's holding himself prisoner. He watched too many seasons of You, except this came before. The B-plot has the Titans searching around and looking for clues like they got a mystery on their hands. There's a river of toxic waste that they find. This will come up later. The mystery starts to unravel in the A-plot. Red Star thinks he's the monster that the village sent them after, but Star says that the monster attacked recently. But Red Star says his incident happened a long time ago. Is there a copycat? When the monster attacks, Star wants to go and fight it, but Red Star wants to stay and let it pass, even if he'll be blamed for it. Active versus passive. Is that the philosophical argument of this episode? Perhaps. After arguing and learning about Red Star, Star is allowed to leave, but the Titans are outside. Red Star gives his Captain America backstory, and Dr. Shang is there. His powers are unsafe, but Star says that they can be used to help the village. Once again, Red Star would rather stay away from people to protect himself. The monster comes and Red fights it back, but he needs a break to shed his powers. This allows the monster to power up with the tubes of energy. Then the A and B plot connect. The toxic waste the Titans found earlier is caused by a leak from Red's energy, which means the monster came from him. Star gives Red a motivational speech about embracing his power, and Red joins them. Robin gives him a communicator. When Red returns, the villagers try to chase him away, but Star stands up for him with force. It's a little out of character, especially considering how she dealt with Valyor. The general buries the hatchet and calls Red by his real name. He beats the monster, but his powers start going out of control, so Star takes him to space, where he releases his power, creating a Red Star. This episode was okay. The theme was be active, not passive. Star helped Red Star with his character arc, and the mystery was interesting. It just wasn't an exciting episode. I like how the Honorary Titans plot continues, despite this not being a key episode. I also like how in the last episode, the Titans were said to be traveling, and in this episode, we see that. This is a cyborg episode. Dr. Light returns and powers his suit with the Northern Lights. This is the first episode where he's actually the main antagonist. The other two times he appeared, he was just in the cold open. Furthermore, he's going 3 for 3 with epic music playing when he's on screen. One of the composers must love Dr. Light. The Titans continue traveling the world. Light hits Raven first. He's looking for revenge for the last two times. When Star is hit, Robin catches her. The writers keep throwing in subtle moments like this. Even BB points out how they usually beat him quickly. After Robin brings back his quips, the fight is interrupted and everyone falls below the ice, introducing a new world. When they meet dinosaurs, BB talks to animals for the first time and the scene is hilarious. After some fighting, Cole and Gnark come to save them. Gnark is afraid of Cyborg's tech. The facial expressions are very dynamic during this episode. After some awkward clunky dialogue, we see Light is spying on them while invisible. I like this because he's presumably manipulating the light around him to do this. Smart. He must use Cole's crystal powers to advance his machine. Cyborg tries to bond with Gnark and eventually does overeating. The lame caveman gets sad over losing an eating contest. He thinks Cole likes them better and is acting petty, but Light interrupts their conversation. Once again, he pulls up with great music. Light beats Nark because he's afraid of technology. He uses the afraid of Light line again. The first time was in Nevermore. Light turns Cole into a battery, which is what she gets for disrespecting the doctor. Nark doesn't want to go to the surface, but Cyborg convinces him with the idea of saving Cole. The music in the final fight is epic and I've been searching for it since 2022. Eventually, I'll find it once the season 5 OST is released. Dr. Light solos the Titans, but Gnark sneaks around to free Cole. Cyborg gives him a wrench, which he used earlier to show him how a light bulb works, and Gnark successfully uses it to free Cole, although not in the expected way. His character arc is completed. Light is still powered up and blows back the Titans, but Robin turns it to him and starts soloing Light. His staff breaks again, and he starts losing because this ain't his episode. The fight is ended with Starfire and Cole. Isn't this a Cyborg episode? Then Raven disrespects Dr. Light. Why do people keep disrespecting him? He just nearly whooped them in a 7v1. I can barely call this a cyborg episode. People jump on his back for mispronouncing the caveman's name, but who really cares? This dude is lame, and so is his crystal meth girl. They're given a calm, and the brotherhood is shown spying on them. This episode was weaker than the last. It was kind of torture. Once again, a titan helps some newbie complete their arc. I don't like this formula, especially compared to episodes where the titans grow. It isn't working, but that might just be because Red Star, Cole, and Nark are lame characters. And Amy Wolfram wrote this. What happened, Amy? The best part of the script was the dino scene. The best part of the episode was the music. The next episode, Hide and Seek, might be another travesty. And the season started off so good too. I was getting ready to rank it higher than season 3. This is a Raven episode. I really want to skip this, but Lightspeed is next, so we'll get through this. I gotta see Kid Flash spit some game. 
This episode has Raven out of her comfort zone when she's forced to become a babysitter. I'm now remembering that Raven is actually the one with the character arc in this episode, so it might be a little better than the last two. The intro is Japanese. The dynamic between Raven and Beast Boy at the start is hilarious. I love seeing a different side of Raven. She's been shown to hate generally pleasant and nice things, and like dark things, so forcing her to take care of kids is contrasting to her interests. Her maternal side is extracted in this episode, adding another layer to her already complex character. I'm also glad she gets an entire episode alone, considering she has the least amount of episodes focused on her. Her lack of chemistry with the kids is enjoyable. She called one of the kids that one, like it was an object. She's in a perpetual state of annoyance. The blonde woman from Every Dog Has His Day is back and on the train. This is her third appearance. Why does she keep returning? Melvin keeps mentioning Bobby, an invisible friend. Melvin insists he's real, but Raven thinks he's fake. We see Bobby fight Grodd when he shows up, but Raven doesn't. The kids continue to be annoying after they escape and it's pretty funny. Raven teaches the kids about breaking and entering when she breaks into the cabin. The BB bits are comedy gold. He's an underrated character. It's subtle, but the plate Raven brought out for Bobby is empty when she walks back in. I love how she completely fails to execute BB's advice. She has negative points in social skills. Timmy and Tantrum are terrorists though. They just constantly cause problems for no reason. When the kids go to sleep, Raven starts to warm up to them. At the gondola, Bobby doesn't think it's safe and Grodd appears, showing that he was right. Raven vs Grodd has the duo of Blur and Shake again. It even uses the first person trick. When they get to the monastery, Bobby doesn't think it's safe again, but Raven says Bobby isn't real and drops off the terrorists on bad terms. Well, maybe if Bobby specified why it wasn't safe instead of being cryptic, we might be able to take his word. When Raven leaves, her experiences with them make her realize that something's wrong when they become too quiet. Raven goes in and finds Grodd has captured the trio. She claims them as her kids when she flies into action. Character development. Raven gets slept and the kids use their powers to free themselves and save her. Bobby finally becomes visible and Raven finally sees him. This giant teddy bear really moonwalks on Grodd and forces him to retreat. He was slamming him around like Hulk in the Avengers. This episode really made Grodd less intimidating. He's losing to Raven and Bobby in 1v1s. Madame Rouge would never. Why is he even here? The kids weren't honorary titans, so why is he chasing them? Now, Raven wants to take care of the kids, but they've matured to the point where they don't require her protection. She gives them a communicator and hugs them all. There's no theme here, but both Raven and the kids have character arcs. I owe this episode an apology. I wasn't really familiar with his writing. This episode is pretty solid. It's constantly funny and entertaining, easily better than the last two. Milf Raven is pretty cool and all, but I gotta see KF put his Mac on. I'm very biased towards this episode. It focuses on two of my favorite supporting characters, Jinx and Kid Flash. KF is just so charismatic and cool, and Jinx is Jinx. Speaking of KF, this is another sidekick of a Justice League member. Apparently Wonder Girl was intended to be in the show and even had a design, but licensing prevented her from being used. That's so stupid. If season 6 comes, I want to see Wonder Girl and Superboy. Back to the episode. The High Five are made up of the original trio, Seymour, who was in the team in May I, Billy Numerous, who first took action in Overdrive, and Kid Wicked. Private Hive has been removed since May I. All of these characters appeared in the background of Deception. The episode starts with the Hive stealing and Kid Flash taking away their stolen goods, but he also leaves Jinx with a rose. Two minutes in and he already has more game than Robin. He should give Boy Wonder some lessons. And then the intro gets interrupted by the villains like it's Jojo. That's really cool. Billy is playing the same racing game that Cyborg and BB play. The chemistry in the Hive is really good. The dysfunction reminds me of early Titans East. The conflict here is that Jinx wants the respect of the Brotherhood, but all her teammates don't care. When the villains go out to steal stuff, KF schools all of them. Similar to For Real, she decides that capturing this hero will gain her respect. Kid Flash makes his first normal appearance when Jinx goes for the necklace. KF shows off his masterful game. He has quick-witted replies and knows the right thing to say, but he's kinda dumb for falling for her act. I guess he got overconfident and assumed that his game was really that immaculate. The high five jump him, but he's too nice. The first person running scene looked great. He gets beaten by Jinx's plot armor and is sadly captured. Although he took an L by getting captured, he shows that he's still in control when he gets food and returns to the cage. He finally points out that the High Five has six members. Kev gets back to work by getting on Jinx's good side. He controls the conversation like Joker in the interrogation room by asking the questions and only answering ones he feels like. He's also funny, adding to his charisma. When Jinx is sucking up to Madame Rouge, Kid Flash does the dash. Kev starts wrecking the place while trolling everyone, showing that he's him. It's expected of a Justice League sidekick. And when he's cornered, he vibrates his molecules through the wall. This man is too cool. No Titan ever stole the hive. At the midpoint, Rouge shows up, but KF is long gone. Like the Doom Patrol did to the Titans, Rouge is sunning the hive. Jinx is the only one who wants to catch KF before Rouge, so she goes solo. 
before she can even do anything. Kid Flash shows up for her with jokes, but it's actually Madame Rouge. That's a good plot twist. Not sure how she knew that would work though. Rouge can catch KF because she has plot armor. Same reason she was able to touch Hotspot. KF uses the arm tornado, a move that Flash uses in JLU, but JLU used Flash as Wally West, which is the same guy as Kid Flash. They really did KF dirty in this fight. Jinx finds him thanks to Seymour. He's the second black guy that's been interested in her. Make that the third. So like Cyborg, she's attracted three different characters. Kid Flash tries to talk her out of being evil like Naruto. It's interesting that she says her bad luck makes being a hero an impossibility. Raven is like a foil to this. She was born to be evil, but she still became a hero regardless. This is interesting because not only are their rooms similar, but they are also always fighting each other whenever they meet. When Jinx shows off her accomplishments to Rouge, she slaps the kid and disrespects her. So Jinx frees him, as she should. Jinx completes her arc when she stops idolizing Rouge. She builds her back and stands up for herself. Rouge and Seymour leave and KF leaves another rose for her. Still got game. Her saying goodbye to Seymour could be interpreted as her leaving the team. KF saying that she could be good and her eventual face turn at the end of the season support this. This was a great episode and it didn't have a single one of the five titans. They had three people writing this episode. Rob Hoagie is one I already covered. Marv Wolfman wrote Deep Six and Titans East Part 1. George Perez only had this episode. Marv and George are actually the comic book duo who created the new Teen Titans. The original Teen Titans were just Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and Green Arrow sidekicks. New introduced Kid Flash, Cyborg, Starfire, BB, and Raven. Slade, Brother Blood, Trigon, and Blackfire are also introduced here. It seems like all the seasonal villains are notable Teen Titans characters from the comics, so I was kinda wrong about Slade being a Batman villain in Season 1. He becomes one, but he starts as a Teen Titans villain. Kid Flash was an extremely charismatic character with cool abilities and great competence. Jinx became a fleshed out character and the chemistry between them was phenomenal. The plot was well paced. I guess the theme could be what KF said to her. You don't have to hurt people to feel good about yourself. Or a more supported theme would be, you don't need the approval of your idols to feel worthy. This is better because Jinx's arc is heavily tied to impressing Rouge and the Brotherhood. This was established very early on and reiterated several times. In the end, she switched to following the theme. Phenomenal episode. Here's some extra trivia. The High Five is based off of the Fearsome Five from the new Teen Titans comics. The original members were Dr. Light, Gizmo, Shimmer, Mammoth, Simon, Jinx, and Neutron. Light and Simon both fought for leadership of the team. In this cartoon, Simon briefly appears towards the end of the season but has no speaking lines, and Light is his own villain. Shimmer isn't here, leaving the trio. Gizmo and Mammoth look pretty accurate, but Jinx has a glow up. The episode starts with a race car villain named Ding Dong Daddy. What kind of name is that? Triple D has stolen Robin's briefcase, somehow, and challenges the Titans to race him for whatever's in it. The intro is Japanese, which fits in this case. The T-Car and R-Cycle find relevance in this challenge. Triple D somehow steals Raven and Starfire's ability to fly. I'd suggest Beast Boy turn into the fastest bird, but he's probably gonna find a way to stop that too. Cyborg's aim is conveniently bad thanks to D's plot armor, but he finally hits him. How is the pit stop faster than the cars? Why doesn't D just ride that? Cyborg's plan for avoiding the pit stop was clever. The subplot of Star and Raven hitchhiking is boring. Then the goat makes his appearance. Red X shows up on his own cycle as a new challenger. What's in the case is a frequently asked question throughout the episode. The guy on the bus is one of the Reddit mod from For Real. Robin and Red X continue to fight. I love how Red X just wants it because he can sell it. It reiterates his selfishness from the last episode that wasn't ever fully discarded. Villains that come back are Gizmo, Puppy King, Mad Mod, Johnny Rancid, Dr. King Light, Control Freak, Kitten Fang, and Adonis, who's rocking yellow for some reason. The pit stop subplot is also stale. Cyborg brings back the chainsaw again. When Red X's cycle gets destroyed, Robin saves him because he's him. Red X pays him back by turning into him and getting rid of all the other villains. Once again, he shifts between good and bad. He deserves a spin-off or something. The way he teleports out of the episode is so cool. Robin beats up Triple D and wins the race. The episode ends with Robin opening the case, but like in Pulp Fiction, we don't get to see what's inside. The important part is Robin learned to share secrets. This episode was decent. It would've been better if they focused more on Robin, Red X, and the other villains rather than the hitchhiking and pit stop. Red X is the GOAT. Go is another flashback episode. This episode shows how all the Titans first met, which is a really cool idea. When Starfire is in alien jail, we see the slug monster from Stranded. She can only speak her own language and is hot-headed. She breaks out and heads to Earth. On Earth, Robin acts like Batman when he stops a robber from the shadows. 
His bird ring is black and gray, rather than red and yellow. Bats fly out before he appears, and his voice is deeper. Robin beats the brakes off the robber. It cuts him off before he can say Batman. I like how they never explicitly mention him. Robin says he's just moved, and works alone, before seeing a green light and explosion. Starfire acts like a berserk lunatic, and wrecks the place before Robin interrupts. He covers his body in his cape like he's Batman. The two begin to battle. The camera angle before Robin jumps away is phenomenal. Great foreshortening, and the way the ground cracks looks beautiful. Robin's staff breaks, again, after hitting Star. BB joins the fight and is still wearing his DP mask. He calls himself an ex doom Patrol member. I like how he knows who Robin is, but then Cyborg joins the fight in his hoodie. It's what he's wearing in the Justice League movie too. Raven interjects and suggests that fighting isn't the answer. Her shyness here is a wild contrast to her present personality. Robin and Cy argue over leadership, which becomes relevant in Season 3. Robin frees her and she kisses him to speak English before flying away. Cyborg is already making fun of Robin and Starfire's relationship, which he also did in Patrol and Stranded. He's the only one who mocks Robin for liking Star. Cyborg, like Star, is short-tempered because his accident was recent and he sees himself as a monster. This is also similar in Justice League. BB's childlike wonder is disarming because he thinks he's cool. The alien ship passes over the island that will become the home for the tower. Robin accepts the help and even uses his optimism to bring Raven along. Speaking of JL, these aliens look like parademons, but they're called Gordanians. The quartet finds Star and the five work together to fight the aliens. Apparently Tamaranians don't have a word for nice, which is a stark contrast to how she becomes the nicest member in the present. Cyborg and BB do their pterodactyl combo for the first time. Cyborg, BB, and Raven form their comedy trio when BB asks if his mask looks cool. Raven pointing out that he's green and can't have a secret identity leads to him taking off the mask. That mask was lame though, they're true friends for telling him. The Titans argue when the aliens charge their laser, and Raven's assertiveness starts to rise. Robin turns into a leader. Cyborg bonds with Raven and makes her feel welcome. The fact that he was able to address being a cyborg with a smile on his face shows his change. When Robin and Star bond, she mentions her babysitter from Betrothed. The Titans work together in battle. Robin notices Cyborg's arms and asks him to make it a weapon, creating the sonic cannon. He says Booyah for the first time after landing his shot. In the conclusion, the group is on the island where the aliens planted their base. Cyborg suggests building a tower, and Raven thinks BB is funny. I like how Cyborg and Robin designed the comms, the tech duo. The episode ends with Robin saying, when there's trouble, you know who to call. Lyrics from the intro. This episode was cool. It's a fantastic origin story for the Titans and gives explanations for so much of the lore. The formation of the Titans, comms, sonic cannon, tower location, and Beast Boy ditching the mask are all explained. The characters are also shown to be very different from the first episode. Robin is darker and more Batman-like. Cyborg and Starfire are very short-tempered, Raven is shy, and Beast Boy acts like a sidekick. If I had to name a theme, I'd say teamwork makes the dream work. This was a great episode to precede the two-part finale. Calling All Titans Part 1, Robin wants to split up to deliver more comms. But BB, using his experience with the Brotherhood, suggests that they stick together. Unfortunately, everyone disagrees with him. Characters that are recruited are Jericho, Argent, Bushido, Panther, and Harold. So while I was looking for Teen Titans video essays to gauge his popularity, I gathered some interesting information about the original comic. Number one is that Jericho is Slade's son in the comics and introduced in an arc named The Judas Contract. Number two is that the Judas Contract is the foundation of Season 2's plot, which is really cool. The members are the same with the exception of Wonder Girl. Robin first becomes Nightwing, and other cool stuff happens. The story sounds amazing. The two videos I watched were Comic Storian's video on Judas Contract and How Teen Titans Adapted Judas Contract by Core Ideas. I'll link both in the description. Back to the video. Bushido was moonwalking on those ninja. He made one ninja stab another and reflected a shuriken back at the thrower with his katana. Robin says the episode's title when testing the comms. Thunder and Lightning are shown as some of the honoraries. So is Wonder Girl. The BOE is listening and starts making their move. SOSs start appearing all over the world when the villains attack. Trident, Gizmo, Billy, Cardiac, some fish guy named XL Terrestrial, and Johnny are shown as pawns of the Brotherhood. Others include Plasmus, Punk Rocket from the last episode, Angel from the Hive in Deception, Mammoth, Get Wicked, some psychic villain named Simon, Kidden, Killer Moth, Cinderblock, Kataro, Cheshire, who's in Young Justice and fights Speedy there too. She's also a Teen Titans villain. Atlas, Private Hive, Fang, Seymour, Warp, Control Freak, Puppet King, Atlas, who's rocking blue this time, Overload, Steamroller, and Instigator, a new villain. Brian is literally playing chess with Robin. They're each moving their pieces to different spots. Robin really got outplayed. Apparently Tram can fight. Kilowatt is a new hero with lightning powers. Rouge attacks Robin as Hotspot. Like I said in Lightspeed, she had plot armor because Robin is bobbing and weaving her easily. Robin realizes that he gave Rouge the calm and trust. It's all coming together. 
After some animated backgrounds, Robin turns into Sasuke and uses his complex shuriken jutsu to combine a freezing disc with a bird ring, freezing Rouge. Then he shatters her. That was epic. What's interesting is that in Batman's contingency plans, his method for defeating Plastic Man is freezing him. Madame Rouge has the same powers as Plastic Man, like father like son. Robin's last move is to destroy all the comms, ending Brain's strategy. Some of the HTs were built different and won their 2v1s, like Jericho and Harold. Robin and some other titans are captured. This is the end of the episode. How did Madame Rouge break free? I'm telling you she has plot armor. This was good. It tied together all the plot threads that had been set up. It brought back a lot of characters and showed that the Brotherhood had been gathering allies. Brain really showed off his intelligence when he nearly checkmated the titans. It was mostly just action, but that was just the first act break of the full story. Part 2 will bring more plot. But where was the Doom Patrol? Titans Together is a Beast Boy episode. We get an opening monologue by Brain about his plan and the visuals of all the Titans losing. The music goes from dramatic to epic when Beast Boy shows up and shows out at the end, being the only hope left. That little riff that played sounded like Miles' light motif from the Spider-Verse. He goes to the emergency base. Moss, Pantera, Harold, and Jericho show up as well. BB forms a team with these remaining heroes. He's rightfully put in charge because, like he said in part 1, he's been fighting them the longest. The Doom Patrol and Brotherhood are generational enemies. The music that plays when he gives his speech is good. BB comes up with a plan and says Titans go again. Together, they allow Jericho to possess Cinderblock. His memories allow them to find the base in Paris. Step 2 is to have Cinderblock bring in the defeated Titans. In the base, they fight some villains after Jericho accidentally speaks as Cinderblock. The new Titans show up to the main room, but are surrounded by all of the other villains. The five go ham and take on all of the villains. LeBlanc, Dr. Chang, and the Master of Games are all in this episode. I like how Harold fights Punk Rocket, they're both musical. The heroes all get subdued, but the other OG Titans start making appearances with their allies. Cyborg, Starfire, and Raven show up with allies. When they show up one by one, each one has a lesson number X. This is reminiscent of the first episode where Robin said, I can think of five good reasons, and then each character said a number as they appeared. The music that plays is also a slowed down version of the motif that was in the songs Titans Ejected and Helping Hand. Those songs played in, you guessed it, Final Exam. Considering that's the first episode that aired, it's cool how many callbacks are referencing it. Also, the characters they showed up with are the characters each of them had an episode with. Star had Red Star, Cyborg had Cole and Gnark, and Raven had the three kids. That's tight. Beast Boy says the episode's title, Titans Together. The second round begins. Malkior from Spellbound, Triple D, and Mother May I are also here. Moss frees Menos and the twins work together to unfreeze the other titans. When the five titans unite, an orchestral version of the intro plays and is hype. And actually have a plan? Yes! We kick the butt! Just like old times! Except better! Let's finish this. The animation turns up and the heroes start winning. Robin and Cyborg do the Sonic Boom combo from Episode 1, a spectacular callback. Raven and Starfire have their own new team attack. Kid Flash and Jinx show up to stop the high five from leaving, which completes her arc. I love the cut of Cyborg punching Control Freak to a different villain falling back. Such an iconic cut. I still remember when I first saw it. Mossy Menos continue to freeze defeated villains. I like how they appreciate KF's speed, and KF shows who's boss by taking out several villains. Raven gets her payback on Simon, who defeated her last episode, and Wildebeest, Hotspot, and Jinx get theirs on Rouge. Great payoffs. Brain and Grodd run away, but BB and Robin chase them down. Brain sets up a fusion bomb to blow up everyone. BB takes Grodd, and Robin takes Brain. Once again, Robin jumps off a high place and grappling hooks at the last second. It's his signature move. Harold sends the bomb into space. BB solos Grodd off screen and freezes him and Brain, leading to the Brain Freeze joke. Everyone sighs, but it wasn't even a bad joke. In the conclusion, all of the heroes are back at the tower, and Dr. King Light attacks a bank. All of the Titans gang up on him, and the episode ends. This reminds me of the JLU finale. I wouldn't be surprised if it was an intentional reference. I love this. There's so much tasteful fan service, plenty of callbacks and payoffs, great music. I just wish Beast Boy was more important in the climax. Yeah, he stopped Grodd, the last villain combatant, but the fight should have been shown and been epic. He should have used the Werebeast form from the Beast Within too. But, he did effectively lead the makeshift titans to the base when everyone else was gone, so he did get his limelight. 
Part 1 unfortunately wasn't focused on him, but this episode allowed him to go solo for half of the episode, so that's alright. As a Beast Boy 2 partner, Homecoming was better because it actually had a character arc for Beast Boy and was personal. Apprentice was personal for Robin, Titans East was personal for Cyborg, and The End was personal for Raven. This two parter was not personal. Additionally, Beast Boy had the weakest connection to his enemy. The DP and BOE are longtime enemies, but between BB and Brain, the only connection is that one is smart and one is dumb. The two don't know each other personally and barely interact. He also didn't incite a change in the hero in either two parters, which is what the other season villains did. So as a personal villain, he was the weakest, but as a worldly villain, he's pretty solid. He will play the Titans and play the long game throughout the season, making nearly every episode technically a key episode. I don't know why the Doom Patrol isn't here, but as a universe finale, this is great. I love how they bring back all heroes and villains for this epic climax. It really does feel like the end of the series, except this isn't the last episode of the season. This is the first season with two two-parters and a final episode that isn't multi-parted. Things change. This is the last episode of Teen Titans and a Beast Boy 1. When the Titans return, many of the stories they loved are shut down. Things have changed. A white monster appears and during the fight, Beast Boy sees Terra the terrorist in the crowd. The fight has Blur and Shake, and the monster has Kevin Levin's powers. When the Titans go in the sewer, BB dips to find Terra's statue, which is now gone. He tells the team, but they think he's imagining things. Robin tells him that he might be seeing what he wants to see, which is funny because he saw Slade and Haunted. BB ditches the team again to find Terra. He doesn't have his priorities straight. She was literally a terrorist. This is yet another time a Titan ditches the team. A sad piano song plays as BB looks at all their old spots to no avail. He eventually finds her in a school, but she doesn't remember him. When they hang out, they bond a little, but she still has no memories. Her name isn't even Tara. She also doesn't like pizza the way Tara did. The differences continue when BB shows the girl Tara's room. I don't know why they kept it. BB goes to the House of Mirrors and meets Slade. This man has appeared in every season. He was one of the main antagonists in seasons 1 and 2. He was in Haunted in season 3. He was a recurring pawn for Trigon in season 4. And now he's in season 5. Slade implies that Terra is choosing not to remember the past. I don't know why he showed up, but the way he walks in the background while talking is cool. BB beats Slade, but it's a robot. Slade did this before. At the midpoint, BB goes to her school, Murakami School. Glenn Murakami is the creator of this cartoon. In the B plot, the Titans keep fighting the white monster. BB follows the girl around in school as she avoids him, but they eventually talk. She refuses the communicator and tells him things change. Robin calls him Beast Boy. He asks the girl to join him, but she refuses. As another sad piano song plays, she says she's not who he thinks she is and fades into the crowd. Beast Boy goes to help his team and the episode ends. This is the saddest episode in the show. The theme is the title, Things Change. I like how the theme is immediately conveyed through the stores in the intro. It's like a microcosm of what's to come. Beast Boy is given hope in the form of a girl that looks like Terra, but his hope is crushed because she's not Terra. Conventionally, her memories would return after being told stories and shown different locations, like Kid Raven in the end. But that doesn't happen here. BB is hit with a crushing reality that this really isn't Terra. There is no happy ending. He just has to accept it. The episode ends before he even has a chance to process this. And the music is on point, emphasizing the sadness. This was an emotional and tragic way to end the series. There's still a movie left, but this was an amazing episode. This was a great season. Season 5 surprised me. Before I started this rewatch, I thought my ranking would be 1, 3, 4, 5, 2. But it's actually 1, 5, 3, 4, 2. As much as I like Cyborg, I have to put season 5 above season 3. My favorite episodes from 5 are stronger than those in 3. Season 5 really gives season 1 a run for its money. If I'm just looking at the best episodes, 5 has better episodes. But if I'm taking the overarching plot into account, 1 is better. My top 5 from this season are Homecoming, Lightspeed, Trust, For Real, and Titans Together. My top 10 episodes overall are Masks, Only Human, Homecoming, Deception, Apprentice, The Quest, Lightspeed, X, Winner Take All, and The End. The fights looked amazing in this season thanks to the use of techniques like motion blur, slight shaky cam, and animated backgrounds. I do wish the fights had more logic, strategy, and choreography, but they're still enjoyable. The issue of plot armor going to the main character of the episode still exists, sometimes the antagonist. The characters are only as competent as the episode allows them to be, but this allows the focus character to save the day, which is poetic. I like how the BOE versus the Titans lasted the entire season. Communicators and BOE members appeared in nearly every episode. Revved Up and Go are the only irrelevant episodes to the overarching plot. 
Jericho and Harold were such missed opportunities. They could have received episodes focused on them in replacement of Red Star or Cole. Jericho is literally Slade's son, so there's a lot of interesting things that could be explored, and Harold is just a cool guy with cool powers. If they were set up as important characters before the finale, it would have made their relevance a strong payoff. It might have even made the season better than season 1. This cartoon really went above and beyond. Great characters, several thoughtful themes, gripping plots, interesting applications of the setting, and solid music. I wish new special moves were consistently kept over time. For example, Robin's disc became a mainstay after reappearing in Winner Take All. They were in episode 1. And so did Starfire's eye lasers. But other power-ups like Beast Boy's Wear Beast only appeared twice. The Sonic Boom also only appeared twice. Cyborg's Tower Power-Up only appeared once. Cyborg's Robot Control only appeared once. Imagine if these power-ups kept returning in dire situations. That would be epic. Each Titan had a decent amount of episodes focused on them. Using my point system, Robin had 12, Cyborg had 11.5, Starfire had 11, Beast Boy had 12.5, and Raven had 11.5. Everyone is between 11 and 12, which is good. Since I'm an anime channel, and this is an anime inspired cartoon, I gotta speak on how this holds up compared to anime. I'll begin with the bad news. The worst episodes in Teen Titans are worse than deranked serial anime. For example, I hate CSM and Blue Lock, but I would rather watch 10 episodes from those anime than the 10 worst episodes of Teen Titans. But when I compare this episodic cartoon to episodic anime, things look much better. Like with the lows of Teen Titans, I would rather watch a deranked serial than the worst episodes of any episodic anime. Overall, Teen Titans is better than the highest ranked episodic anime that I've watched. That includes Lupin the Third, Cowboy Bebop, Samurai Champloo, Space Dandy, and Evangelion. The highs of Teen Titans surpass the highs of any episodic anime I've seen. On a cartoon scale, Teen Titans is an A+, easily. On a universal scale, which includes anime and movies, it's an A. For an episodic show to get an A+, nearly every episode has to be around an A, with the lowest being a B+. I can easily say that this is the best western cartoon of all time might even go as far as the best western TV show of all time. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, share, subscribe, and help me revolutionize the manga industry by buying my manga and spreading the word. All important links will be in the description.